starting channel with the foreign video is questionable, right? But there is something so relatable about this show that people keep on discussing it. Is Casey, Maddie or Jules a bad person or just damaged? Why is Sam Levinson such a bad writer? And will they start filming the third season? Are you high? I mean... <laughs> How many girls have you fucked? Wait, what? Oh my god, do I look like I'm in Oklahoma? Oklahoma, the musical. But really, what is the meaning of euphoria? Technically? Well, it seems obvious for the first season. It is about how cool being young is. I'm envious of your generation, you know. I mean, right. Or not so cool, but looking great in scary contemporary world of technologies, and life is full of suffering and traumas, first love and addiction. The second season changed it and everything else completely. It looks different. It is dark, primary tones are brown, sepia and yellow against blue, purple and pink of the first season. Here are same outfits in first and second season, but change in color palette is pretty drastic. It was filmed on real actual film, and all the speculations about digitalized modern life was over. I mean, they barely touch their phones, like... What year is this? First season was so modern, so contemporary, so end of 2010s, it seemed unprecedented. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Shit. <laughs> In seconds sometimes it looks like 70s because of the lightning and grainy image, but most importantly it feels different. Watching first season one might feel a bit of longing for the feeling of being young, but second is the essence of nostalgia. Nostalgia for other times, for different cinema, for the first season even. The difference between two seasons is so stark that I cannot stop thinking about it. So, when I saw this, I immediately thought about that. That accidental similarity between otherwise completely different films got me thinking, maybe there is something more to it. People like to think of themselves as points moving through time, but I think it's probably the opposite. We're stationary, and time passes through us. Here is the scene. I'm not saying any of it was planned. I'm not even saying that it was ever on Sam Levinson's mind. But an intentional similarity sometimes means even more than purposeful ones. Just like I'm thinking of ending things, Euphoria uses memories as plot device, showing us their power, the strength of the group they have on us, whether they are traumatic or happy. Pain imprints in minds as a point of no return to which person is doomed to come back like that funeral. How much time do we spend remembering and fantasizing? Well, in Kaufman's movie, protagonist Jake basically lives in this imaginary world. Fill my brain with lies to pass the time. <laughs> and the four characters too, either lives in their memories, repetitive flashbacks, or in daydreams about better life. I feel like I've lived most of my life in my imagination. Taking the smallest moments and dreaming them up into something bigger. Yes, you did. If you compare Euphoria to different teen films, you'll be surprised how little time those wild kids spend outside home, houses and rooms in general. Especially in second season, they never visit any public places and rarely go outside. They even got married to work in another house. This homebound strategy is another connection between Euphoria and I'm thinking of ending things that is really meaningful. Here are three main scenes or spaces features in both shows. Let's examine them closer. <laughs> Unforgettable part of I'm thinking of ending things is a family dinner with parents in childhood home. With Jake, we experience anxiety, hidden or not so much, fear, shame and regret. At the same time, deep eternal connection to people and places you knew as a child that shapes life experience. Euphoria too has special relationship with houses and parents. Parents are the only adults Euphoria kids interact with, proving that those relationships are the most important. Home is the place where you live and where you hide. 
of which you remember every wall pattern, the place that is a part of yourself and of which you are a part forever. Out of sight, out of mind. Other scene that Euphoria and I'm thinking of ending things shares is a school hall. And it is not a welcoming place to be, a path you have to walk again and again and to be judged, to be laughed at and scared. School Hall is a society, a crowded street of the teen town, paving its way into the adult world. In a way, you can never escape it. It is the last thing Jake sees in his life. Rue seems to find the way out of the school hall, but you can never be so sure. Car riding scenes are very common, I know. For the Kaufman's movie, 70% of which happens in the car, the Trident situation serves as a plot device and as a metaphor. A way to keep its character trapped in constant dialogue, while life passes by behind the windows. But Euphoria uses cars very often too. Lots of emotional investing scenes happen in the vehicle. As well as major plot points. Take car scenes out, and you have no story at all. Car also happens to be the best place for daydreaming. Bobby, Bobby, it's a fire! We got well, those were more of a formal similarities, which can be easily dismissed as a pure coincidence. There are also similitudes that show a deeper connection between those two on the level of narrative structure. Genre is where I've seen things. Our understanding of life and art is based on it. When we dream about love, or fantasize about being productive and talented, we use cinematic cliches, don't we? Both shows mix in genres to illustrate the manufactured nature of its characters' experiences. I'm Thinking of Ending Things starts as psychological melodrama with elements of thriller and even horror, and ends as a drama with a belly sequence. There is also a romantic comedy episode. Euphoria is also quite a mixture, romantic teen drama with bits of drug crime genre with comic episodes like Making of Lexi's Play. Then there is episode 5. It is a desperate drug addiction film, it is camp with long-awaited Cassie's exposure, it is absurd slapstick with the chase. What was that? I said I'm headed. <laughs> Elements of different genres play with audience expectation and hide the fact that some of the events on the screen are not really happening, but some elements are just too out of place. Drug dealing teacher in message chair with a parrot in one case, and 50 ice cream kiosk with bullying waitresses on a blizzard night in the other really levels up the weirdness of the events on the screen. It's a fucking blizzard out there. Those places are sinister, and they promise even worse things to come. I'm serious. Both of them, fittingly, don't actually add something to the plot, but signifies end of one fantasy and arrival of reality. Well, one can ask, if most of it is nothing but the dream, that why it is so depressing? Jake's girlfriend wants to dump him, and Rue can't think of anything better than drugs. Depressed people produce depressed dreams, I guess. But there is a place to shine, and just like in reality, it is the stage. Jake's imagined performance is trivial, just some Nobel Prize and a song from favorite musical. Lexi's play is more tricky. It is actually a prequel to first season, but from Lexi's point of view, that affects style and tone. Both films share the same twist. Narrator turns into a character. Still may seem as the same, how memories and traumas constitutes our identities. An addict, loner, abuser, artist, janitor. How our fantasies shield the reality. I'm thinking of ending things finally said. Even in death, there is no way out of escapistic dreams. Before I give us glimpses of hope. I remember Ali said, the thought of maybe being a good person is what keeps me trying to be a good person. 
That thought of being a good person means just that, really be.